This video contains information that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are a viewer and are triggered or shocked by images and need a warning prior to every clip or story being discussed, then please unsubscribe from my channel immediately. My channel covers the harsh reality of even the worst crimes imaginable and is for adults only. For those of you who fit into this category, take this message as your warning and don't watch any further. Yo, <laughs> yeah, I got a the shirt that I have on is pretty crazy because uh, I have it cut in the back so that my wound doesn't have the shirt on it, so it doesn't fit that great. All right, but anyways, you guys got to hold on for a second. My mom just called. Oh man, that's so classic. You know, that's my mom for you. you. You tell her, "Hey, mom, I'm doing a show right now. I just started," and she goes, "Oh wow, okay, yeah." But you know, I was what happened was is I was you know, and it's this long, long story. But I said, "Hey, mom, they're all waiting. I got to go back." <laughs> that's awesome. Anyways, Kubi found the. Uh, the arrest warrant. And then I said, hey, where, how'd you find that? And then she said, the sheriff's department. How about you give me a little bit more, you know. Because I call, I went and looked at, when I was watching the press conference, it said you had to be in the media portal to get it. You know, but I don't actually, the thing is, a lot of times I don't have a lot of time to troubleshoot something like that. Like, oh, wait, I got to find the document. Because I gotta get together the entire show. So, anyways, I figured out that um, Zozo, Jenny, Penny, and Kubi are like uh, the mod squad, you know. But they mix with um, the Three Stooges, okay? So it's like if you could somehow combine the mod squad and the Three Stooges together. <laughs> uh, yep, that's right. That's right. So I'm not intentionally live, uh, leaving this. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, three Stooges. You know, the goofiness. See, the goofy and then you know, the smarts, right? Goofy smartness. Yep. That's right. 100%. No doubt about it. Yep. Well, I thought of Charlie's Angels, too, because then 
Uh, you know, but, you know, what it, I don't know. It didn't really work. Well, actually it worked, but Jenny Penny didn't like it when I mentioned that. Yep, a bunch of stooges in there. Yeah, because then you, you you would you would be the the next generation Charlie's Angels, right? Because you'd be Lu Lucy Lou, and then the other two would be the brunette and the blonde, right? So. And yes, I, it's because you're Asian that you would be the Lucy Lou character. See, there you go. I already answered your question because I knew that wasn't coming. See, there you go. <laughs> That's the truth, right? It's pretty obvious. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. I have to come up with some other reason. Um, Got to be in the PC world. No. It's just because she's the only, you're the only Asian of the three, and there's only one Asian of the Charlie's Angels. So there you go. Right. See, unfortunately, that's what, uh, a lot of times, that's what the, that's what somebody assumes that you're saying, which is kind of weird. I don't know, it looks like a big deal since you've typed in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten comments. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, by the way, the, uh, the Brianna Taylor case, it was amazing all of the, the hype that was made by the athletes and everything. And it turns out, you know, in the, uh, it is a tragedy, you know, how Brianna Taylor, Taylor got killed, but... A lot of the stuff that the media was telling everybody was completely bullshit. Okay, oh my God, it was a a no walk war a no knock warrant, and they just went flying in there, guns a blazing. Well, here, here's what it, the reality was: is that I think originally it was a no knock warrant, then it was changed to a knock warrant. So they actually knocked on the door of the apartment. They knocked on the door. And uh, there was no answer. So then they had authority to kick the door down. After they kicked the door down, the boyfriend of Brianna Taylor, who had a legally owned gun, fired at the police officers, and it hit one of the officers in the leg. And he went down, and then they just started firing. And in the crossfire, Brianna Taylor got shot. Okay? Now, her death is a tragedy. Uh, like, it was, wasn't intentional. And the thing is, is even the homeowner, uh, not the homeowner, but the boyfriend, I don't know if they owned it or what they were renting or what they were probably renting because I think it was an apartment. They, uh, you know, he had the right to shoot too, right? Because he's like, who the hell's coming in here? Okay, but the officers had a right to defend themselves at that point. So that's what's kind of weird about the whole story is it's not like how they tried to make it sound like. It's unbelievable. Man, what, what are the officers supposed to do after you kick in the door and then you get shot at? Are you supposed to allow yourself to be shot and try to figure out what's going on? How come there isn't one comment in the comments talking about what I'm saying? That's amazing. What does he say, Hannity? Louisville? Man, okay, quit with the highs, all right, okay? We're, you know, everybody knows, hey, hey, you know, hey. They did. They did announce themselves, Gene Fish. I just told you that. I explained the whole damn thing. Did you Did you not listen? They, uh, they announced themselves first. They got no reply. Uh, a person in the complex actually heard them say, do that. That was the witness that corroborated what the police were saying, that they did announce themselves. Then they kicked the door down, went inside, and then they were shot at. And, and, and the officer was actually hit by a bullet in the leg. Then they returned fire. Apparently, they saw two figures there. Yeah. It's just unreal, man. 
Just think of all the bullshit and the riot. Two officers, by the way, have been shot tonight in Louisville because of the this, this riot here. It's unreal. People just don't get it. Oh, and then you got these people on CNN still telling you that it was a murder. There is no way in hell. It's so far away from a murder. Now, one officer was charged um, with sort of like reckless. I forgot the actual charge, but he was just discharging his gun in there. But you could make an argument in court that he was trying to help the other two officers because they got shot at. (laughs) I don't know, man. It's just, it's incredible, the shit that's going on right now. Absolute, yeah, it's an absolute accident. Um, You know, and they say, well, what punishment is there? Well, here's what you did. You punished every single taxpayer in Louisville because you got $12 million of the funds that they don't, that they put in there for taxes. Uh... You know, it's been paid for, okay? So that's the punishment. It was an accident. And it really, you know, yeah, yeah, wanton endangerment. I don't know. I think that guy's not even going to get charged either when it, when it's all said and done because he's probably trained to help defend the other officers. Yeah, she wasn't, they keep saying on TV that she was slept um, asleep in bed. She was standing in the hallway next to him. There was two figures Okay, so I, I'm just trying to speak the truth here. I don't really get what, once this information came out, you know what the, you know what the problem is? Is it's not believed at that point. It's a, it's a conspiracy at that. Oh, yeah, it's all made up now. The officers invented everything. That's just a big cover-up. And then the guy that was talking today, the district attorney, or the attorney general, excuse me, he was probably... Uh, you know, covering up for everybody too, and it sucks. It just the whole thing. All these riots and everything over. You know, some of these cases. You know, give me a break. Yeah, and it's it's terrible that she got killed. Uh, she seems like she was a good person. Uh, you know emergency room nurse like or something like that but you know she's a good person it's just one of those crazy situations had, you know had they answered the door maybe or he didn't shoot Crappy first when, coffee hot beverage you know he's a he's a legal gun owner so when people come in to the house doesn't he have to also does he do you shoot first every single time or do you say hey who's this I don't know it's just a a mess up and you know you might come down to who who did the warrant was the warrant justified but then at the same time was it really their fault that things went bad seems really obvious it's strange that people can't grasp it though yeah anyways that's it on that and yes uh lee d just a crappy crappy cup of coffee okay You know, but here's the thing. Here's the reality of it. It's called it's tunnel vision or confirmation bias. So right now there was a whole belief structure built around Brianna Taylor, T-shirts made, uh, back of uniforms in the NBA and all this kind of stuff. And instead of just going, wow, this was all sort of based on a, a truth that we didn't know. Uh, a, a fault, you know, a lie, basically. Uh, what that's what it was all built on, okay. And so instead of just believing that, it's trying to confirm something that isn't true continually. After that, I mean, you, listen, go, go watch CNN. People are still saying it was murder. It was really, man. It's about as far away from murder as you can get at this point. It isn't even close. The. Uh, Grand jury wasn't even close. Okay. All right. So, anyways, uh, that's the update on that. Um, hate to, you know, upset the people who really was were hoping it was something more. Well, actually, I, I don't. I just like to tell the truth. Yeah, I don't really. You know, I don't want to know her backstory that much or anything like that. Um, you know, if that comes out later, great, but I'm just giving you the facts on the ground 
that they, you know, really general facts. I'm not giving you, like, I'm not reading the document. Thanks, Zozo. Or should I say one of the three, uh, well, I don't want to say stooges, okay. The mod squad, okay. Right, I already mentioned the 12 million. Yeah, I already said that. <clears throat> yeah, so when they say, oh, wow, you know, what, what justice is there? Well, you got $12 million for an accident. Okay, and that doesn't bring back Brianna Taylor whatsoever. But, I mean, there was a civil action taking place. And that's what happens in accidents like that. Now, the Mod Squad was great. Pete, Link, and Julie, right? And it was just such a cool show. I think when you go back and watch it now, it seems a little cheesier. But at the time, man, that sucker, that was awesome. And we, we decided that uh, Jenny Penny is Link, okay? Or she did, because she thought he dressed cooler than the rest of them. She must have quit watching after the uh, the Charlie's Angels. Uh. All right. So, how many is everybody here? That well, I don't know. If everybody's here. The show just kind of throughout the night gets different people watching. <clears throat> Oh, cooking dinner? Yeah. He, who, how dare you cook dinner? Yeah, make the uh, galbi beef. You know, I used to love kimchi, galbi beef, and sticky rice. <clears throat> but the thing is, is kimchi, I can't eat it anymore <clears throat> because the <coughs> uh, the cabbage, my God, it, my stomach just goes whoop. I mean, it just... Absolutely can't tolerate it at this point. But I love it, though. You know? Wish I could keep eating it. Pickled cabbage, basically. And hot. And I like the, uh, the rooster sauce, you know? Yeah, well, they're going to bring the National Guard in there, so that's cool. Yeah. All right, anyways, I'm going to move on now. We're going to kick over to the topics of the show. I think I actually may have found somebody that might be an individual that Glenn Samuel McCurley may have been responsible for okay there's one one of the cases that i found felt like it could be anyways but let's read the warrant and sort of get a you can get kind of a profile of this guy probably from this i haven't really read it yet so i'm just going to move down to where it starts okay this is the warrant that kubi got on Sunday, February 17th, 1974, at approximately 1.53 in the morning, Benbrook Police Officer P. Kelly and Irvin were dispatched to a possible kidnapping and shooting call at 3908 Williams Road. So I think, I think we had that, right? 3908. Yeah, I think... Oh, that's a house. Okay. Oh, that's right. He probably just went home and then... 39 Williams Road, Officer Kelly and Officer Irvin learned the following summary of information from the victim's family and boyfriend. The victim identified as Carla Jan Walker, a 17-year-old white female, had been out with her boyfriend, Rodney McCoy, at a Valentine's dance. After the dance, McCoy and Carla were sitting in his car in the parking lot of the 
uh, Rig uh, was it like Ridgely Bowling Alley, located at 3400 Ramona in Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Texas. While in the car, a male opened the passenger side door of the boyfriend's car. The male pulled Carla out of the passenger side and told McCoy, I'm going to kill you, and then shot at McCoy. The man took Carla and fled. I wish I had more detail on that part of it. Like, how did that work? Did he just drag her over to another vehicle? And McCoy was crying. And then how did you get her into the car and then run around to the other side without her getting out? McCoy was crying and had difficulty giving more information. So this is a case from last night. So if you're, if you weren't paying attention, you didn't watch the show last night or watch the replay this morning, you're not going to know what we're talking about. Except I'm, this affidavit <laughs> actually has the story in it. But we kind of went over the whole thing. I found the um, culvert that the body was found in, that kind of thing. McCoy was crying and had difficulty giving more information. Blood was present in his head, or on his head and face and clothing. An ambulance was called for him. Benbrook officers waited with him until Fort Worth police officers arrived. On Sunday, February 17th, 1974, at approximately 2.01 in the morning, Fort Worth police officers uh, Weaver and Barksdale received a call to investigate a shooting and possible kidnapping that had occurred at 3400 Ramona, the Ridgely Bowling Alley. The officers met with Miss Walker, Carla Walker's mother, and learned the same basic information that had been given to Benbrook Police Department. McCoy was transported by ambulance to John Peter Smith Hospital. Officer Weaver and Barksdale followed the ambulance. Officer Weaver examined McCoy at the hospital and observed an injury to the back center of his head and a slice in the front left area of his scalp. I mean, you know what's amazing? He got shot three times in the head, but they were all glancing Wounds. He must have been like dodging all over the place. Uh, believed to be a sh uh, gunshot wound was discovered to be more likely a pistol whipping. So maybe he had, was shot at twice and then hit with a pistol. Because remember that one time? He did say he hit him. FWPD Detective Hudson was assigned this case for follow up investigation. Several people, including Rodney McCoy, were interviewed. Hudson learned the following summary of information during those interviews. McCoy and Carla were boyfriend and girlfriend and had been and had been for some time. On the evening of February 16, 1974, they went to the Valentine's Day uh, dance at Western Hills High School. They left the dance with another couple. The four of them drove around cruising and were drinking alcohol. McCoy and Carla eventually dropped off the other couple back at the school. Once McCoy and Carla were alone again, they got some food and then went to the bowling alley so that Car Carla could use the restroom. They got back to the car and were talking when a male opened the passenger side door where Carla was leaning against. So she was just kind of leaning against that door, you know, hell, who knows, maybe she even had her feet up on his lap while he was, you know, she was just, they're just bullshitting. The male forced Carla out of the car while pointing a gun at McCoy and telling him that he was going to kill him. McCoy was struck by something and felt pain to his head. Carla told McCoy to run. So Carla told McCoy to run. Wow, even though she's being kidnapped, she tells McCoy to run. Wow. His head was bleeding and he passed out. When he came to, he thought he saw a car and Carla was gone. McCoy drove to Carla's parents' house and told them what happened. Photographs were taken and various items were collected from McCoy's car at the bowling alley parking lot. Among the items collected was a 22 Ruger magazine that was found on the ground near Carla's purse. The magazine was believed to have been dropped by the suspect when he kidnapped Carla. Carla Walker was missing for three days. 
Then, on February 20th, 1974, Carla's body was discovered by Fort Worth Police Department officers in a cement culvert. Now, let's see if I got that right. I was hoping I got the right one, but let's, let me try it now. 644, that doesn't seem like the same road. So, it's not, I had it within a mile, but that doesn't, I don't think mine's a cement culvert, though, so. I was kind of excited about finding that, but maybe it's not it. No, it's not even. Wow. That'd be crazy. Was it? Does this road keep going around then? Let's see. Yeah, that's Pearl Ranch Road. Let me check it out. Because what they said was, well, I guess it could be a mile. Look at that. <laughs> That's crazy, because look at that, 377 goes down like that, so it's almost exactly the same distance on that same road, but over maybe in this area. Okay, cool. So let me go down to street view here, see if that cement culvert is still around. I think it's got to be right in here, right? Yeah, there it is. And there, that could even be that post that we were looking at just years later. But look at that's a cement culvert right there. All right. Well, there you go. I did as best I could given what I had, but there you go. There's actually another, almost exactly the same everything, same road, but all the way over here, one mile. It's wild. And it's got to be 6440. It's got to be this one right here. All right. I like having it accurate. I like getting it right the first time, but now we have it. Hey, thanks, Kit Kat. Let me just make sure there isn't another one right in here. Okay, that's another pipe one. So that's got to be it. And that was much larger, too. And that's what, what the article said, a large culvert. That's amazing that they found her, don't you think? I mean, that's amazing that they somebody actually went in that area. They, officers found her while looking for her. Okay. So there we go. Let me save that. Thanks, Lori Staggs. Yeah, it's not bad hanging out with you guys. All right. So, Carla Walker was missing for three days on February 20th, 1974. Carla's body was discovered by Fort Worth Police Department officers in a cement culvert located near 6440 Pearl Ranch Road. Carla had various visible scratches and bruises on her face, neck, and body. So, yeah, I wonder if, let's see, Carla's dress was torn apart and her bra was pushed up. Her panties, pantyhose, and shoes were completely off. Carla's body was positioned in such a manner to be suggestive of sexual assault. Man, I don't, you don't think he assaulted her inside the... Uh, Culver, do you? Carla's autopsy was conducted by Tarrant County Medical Examiner, Dr. Felix uh, Guads, during which the following was determined. Carla's cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation. That's what I was thinking. And it's a homicide. Evidence of sexual assault. And then she had multiple abrasions and superficial lacerations of head, neck, and lower extremities. So it almost sounds like, like she was tortured or something. Several subjects were looked into over the years with no definitive conclusion. In February 2019, Bennett, Bennett and I, Wagner, reopened the case for active investigation. We began to speak with family and friends, witnesses, prior people of interest, 
and any new people that came to light as a result of new information. Potential evidence that had been previously collected and Carla's clothing were sent for DNA testing. As a result of the test, a male DNA profile was found. This DNA was found on Carla's bra and possibly other areas of her clothing. The DNA profile was subsequently uploaded into CODIS in March 2020. No matches were identified. As an additional method to supplement the CODIS entry, this DNA was sent to another lab to conduct forensic genealogy research. The information was uploaded to GEDmatch, a genealogical uh, database, using the information received through the database potential contributor suspects were narrowed down to a family of three brothers by the surname of McCurley. The name McCurley was recognized and connected to a possible suspect in the Carla Walker case files. During the initial investigation in 1974, Glenn Samuel McCurley had been identified as a person of interest. He was identified during a search of Ruger 22 purchases. On April 3, 1974, Fort Worth Police Department, Detective Sinclair Hudson and Wood picked up and interviewed McCurley regarding Carla's death. See, this is pretty crazy. Uh, his wife was gone and she was out of town. I mean, see, all of these things, it should have made them look deeper, man. His wife was gone out of town uh, to West Texas. McCurley advised that the 22 Ruger had been stolen approximately six months earlier. Really? Did you file a police report around the time of the offense while he was fishing at the river? Oh, of course. He had not reported, okay, because he was an ex-con. Okay, so he's got an excuse for everything. He went to the pen in 1961 for car theft, and as I found in newspapers.com, it's right here. This is 1961, February 25th. Glenn Samuel McCurley, 18, uh, address listed as West, at Westview Boys Home in Oklahoma, was charged with auto theft. He is accused of stealing a 1955 model Pontiac owned by Ken Brizendine. So that, that was the one loan charge that I could find. Okay. So he had not reported because he was an ex-con. He went to the pen in 1961 for car theft. He had been living at 7100. Okay, let me put find that one. Willis for 2 years. Okay, so let me see where that is compared to what I have where he lives now before he got arrested. Oh, he's right in the same area. Jesus. Wow. Okay. So this is where he lived in 74. And then he lived right there. So he didn't move far away at all. He's a truck driver. Wow. Man. They need to go track down where the hell he was. The hours he worked during the offense, Saturday, February 16th, 7.56 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. But the offense was on the 17th. Maybe they get to that here below. Oh, there it is. Sunday, February 17th, he was off work. He didn't have any work. Then, at 7.48 a.m. on the 18th, while just hours after, he put her body probably in the culvert. You know, we don't know what time he put her there, but I'm assuming it was late at night. It could have even been the following day. I mean, the night could have been... Jeez. How long was the wife out of town? Detectives did not pursue McCurley after his interview in 1974. Wow, that's genius. He was not looked at again until the information from Jedmatch came to life. How could you not look at him again? <laughs> God, hold on a second.
All right. Doesn't it just bug you that they didn't really look at him continuously? He was just such an obvious person. Wife out of town, had, was off of work that day, and he has the same damn weapon and then came up with an excuse on how he lost it right around that same time. What a miracle. Jeez, I, I would have been following that guy around. I would have leaned on a little harder back in 74. You could probably almost put a cigarette out on his face and it had been okay. On July 7th, 2020, Fort Worth Police Department officers collected discarded trash from a household trash bin on the street in front of Glenn Samuel McCurley's residence. Items from the trash were sent out to be tested to attempt to identify a match to the male DNA profile found on Carla Walker's clothing. On September 4th, 2020, I received verbal confirmation that an item of the... Dis I think you have to do the genealogy to get the warrant to then get his trash. I mean, to be able to test the DNA in the trash. Although, you know, the trash is discarded. I don't know. I mean, I don't know why they didn't just sort of test it sooner if you can just do that. So anyways, the DNA on the trash matched the DNA profile from Carla Walker's clothing. On, December, on September 10th, 2020, Bennett and I went to the residence of Glenn Samuel McCurley. We were invited in and spoke with it, McCurley and his wife. During the interview, we were told the following information. The McCurleys have lived in the area since 1972 and lived at their current residence since 1978. Oh, weird. Okay, wow. So they just moved, like, in between that time. Like, I, I want to know when they... Okay, so 78's when they moved there, then, I guess. But they've lived there that whole time. That's awesome. And that's a little interesting, too, from the one case that I think maybe... They were looking at McCurley because he had recently purchased an additional magazine... For his 22 Ruger. Wait, let's see. In 1974, Fort Worth police detectives went to McCurley's work, brought him to the police department, and interviewed him, and then they were interested because he had purchased a 22 Ruger. He told detectives that his 22 Ruger had been stolen while he was fishing. I mean, you'd think somebody picking up the case files over the years would have went back and found that reference and been a little more interested. He stated that he did not kill anyone. He did not know Carla. And his wife stated that she was out of town. So they repeated the same story they told all those years ago. I asked McCurley if he would be willing to give a DNA sample. He said that he would. McCurley signed a voluntary consent form and permitted me to obtain a two buckle swab samples from his mouth. Thanks, Emily Flotilla. These swabs were then sent to a lab for analysis. On September 16, 2020, I received confirmation that Glenn McCurley's DNA matched the DNA found on Carla Walker's bra. Furthermore, McCurley lived approximately one mile from the offense location in 1974. He owned a weapon believed to be the same type as the one that was used during the offense. He was off work the evening of the, the offense and the next day. Uh, his wife was out of town during the time of the offense. Yeah, these are all things that you knew, though. <laughs> McCurley did not know Carla. McCurley is known to have two male siblings, neither of which is an identical twin. That, based on the above facts and information being related to her, and as a result of her investigation, your affiant has reason to believe and does believe that Glenn Samuel McCurley, white male, date of birth, did intentionally and knowingly, did then and there commit the offense of capital murder. 
Yeah. I bet he's a serial killer. You, you don't just do that. You know? You just don't do that. Yeah, well, they, they should have been all, all over that, guys, from a long time ago. Okay, a long time ago. Yeah, so I think I'm gonna. There's one that I added in later, but I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna skip that one. Maybe. Well, I'll just bring it up. But this is one from 1967, and it was a little bit out of, out of the area, but right in that same general area. So that's why I included it here. So this is 1967, and it's the the red-haired woman, Mrs. Mildred May of 3201 Willing had been reported missing by her husband, John, at 8 a.m. Her auto was discovered locked on the east shoulder of the West Freeway near the Clover Lane exit about three hours before her mangled body was spotted by two youths on the northeast slope of the levee near where Carver Avenue passes under the North Freeway. Yeah, so I actually have... Yeah, it says where Carver Avenue passes under the North Freeway. I think it might even be up, up in this area. But, uh, you know, the way they described it, it was on Clover Lane. And so, anyways, her car was somewhere around in this, this area. And where she lived. Right here. So, compared to, like, all the other... I mean, it's just right in the same town and everything. And it's, but it sounds like he didn't live in that particular area until 72. And this is 1967. But I don't know if he lived, you know, somewhat nearby or, you know, anything like that. Her auto was discovered locked on the east shoulder of the West Freeway near the Clover Lane exit about three hours before her mangled body was spotted. A mysterious caller telephoned May twice during the morning. Uh, I, think, I think that might be in the morning while he was waiting for developments. But May said all he could hear was heavy breathing before the caller hung up. So this is uh, the husband. Dr. Felix uh, Gwautz. I think that's the same name from the other article deputy county medical examiner said a slender mark around mrs may's throat indicated she had been strangled so you know if we look at mccurdy uh, hold on a second let me get his full name Oh, weird. I guess I did put that in there. Yeah, McCurley, not Curdy. So McCurley, M C C U R L E Y. Okay. So it's never him. You know, he brazenly kidnap somebody out of a car so anything easier than that he could easily do like he literally took her out of a car with the boyfriend sitting there and then took her and apparently like had her for a while then killed her and he strangled her she died of asphyxiation so there you go i mean so here's another strangulation in the area just five years prior uh Let's see, the findings of the autopsy performed Saturday at All Saints Hospital are consistent with criminal assault. The woman's mangled body covered with bruises and scratches was found by two youths riding a motorbike through the area. Lee Toll, 19, son of Mr. and Mrs. Leon Toll of 321. It's weird how they always gave out everybody's addresses back then. And David Rourke. Uh, Dewey were headed north on top of the levee and were 
about to ride down the slope toward the river when they spotted Mrs. May's body. Toll, who said the pair must have driven past the woman on the gravel road between the levee and the river without seeing her. So, uh, let me go look at that. See, I have the body based on how they described it, um, an address. Let me see. That's yeah, actually a different spot, but this one right here. So the river's over here. So I don't know. Let me look down. Yeah, so that looks like that's a levee right there. So it's probably more like over here, and that was a gravel road at one time. But the way they described it, it was right. This is the address they actually gave, and that's nowhere near the river, you know. I mean, it's near, but not where you're next to a levee. So they could have just been giving something that was close. Let's see. So, Mrs. Mildred May, 37, died early Saturday morning at the hands of a rapist while her family slept in their homes unaware that she was kidnapped and in trouble. Today, more than 48 hours later, police are still puzzled. They sift through every piece of evidence, check out every telephone call, hoping to stumble across a clue that will solve the woman on the levee mystery. They actually name it, Woman on the, on the Levee Mystery. That began Friday afternoon. 5.30 p.m., uh, PM, John McDonald, May 42, told his wife goodbye and walked out of their home. <clears throat> so this is the story being told right here. This is on Friday. John McDonald, the husband, told his wife goodbye and walked out of their home at 3201 Willing, uh, Willing en route to a wild game dinner in Dallas. So this is the home. You know, just to get a look at it. And I'm sure that's the same home. That doesn't look like that's changed a bit. Miss May was lying on the living room divan uh, dressed in a white blouse, pink stretch pants, and gold shoes. She had told her husband when he arrived home from work at 3.30 p.m. she didn't feel well. I have a headache, she said. At 6.15, Miss May talked by telephone with her daughter, Mrs. Joanne Allen, 20, of 4144 South Henderson, telling her she was preparing supper for herself. Your father's gone to Dallas tonight, she said, and I'm here alone. I'm going to eat, bathe, and go to bed. I have a terrific headache. She hung up. Isn't it amazing the details in these older articles? I mean, this, this right here would never be in there. It wouldn't be told like this either. But the murderer ever, no one but the murderer ever talked to her again. Friday at midnight, May returned from the Nash, this is the, I guess the, is that the husband's name? May, hold on. No, that's her, Miss, let's see. Okay, so Friday night, May returned from the National Guard Armory in Dallas and found, oh, that's the husband, and found his home dark and saw that his 1959 white Pontiac was missing. He thought his wife had become lonesome and had gone to visit a friend, forgetting the time. And John May then went to bed. Then on Saturday at 7 a.m., John May w awoke. So he goes to sleep thinking that, you know, she went over to her friend's house and took the car. His wife was still gone. So he gets up at 7, she's still gone. 
May called everyone he could think of to inquire about her. They all gave him the same answer. No, I haven't seen her. Then at 8 a.m., May called the city police. My wife's gone, he said. His call was transferred to Officer C.H. McCook in the Missing Persons Bureau. Then Saturday at 10.30 a.m., the phone rang at the May home. Miss Allen, uh, Mrs. Allen answered it and heard heavy breathing on the other end. Is Miss Allen the daughter? I can't remember now. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, Miss Joe Allen. That's her, her daughter. Okay. So her daughter was now over at the house. So Miss Allen, her daughter, answered and heard heavy breathing on the other end. She said, hello. The call hung up. That's weird. And then Saturday at 10.40 a.m., again the phone rang. Again, the heavy breathing. Again, silence. Mrs. Allen's husband contacted the phone company asking that, they, that a tracer be placed on the telephone. At 11.15 a.m., the phone rang for a third time. Mrs. Allen kept the receiver off the hook, but no one spoke. And yes, everybody, I'm just a cup of coffee. Nobody spoke. Okay. The telephone company said the call had come from a Jefferson Exchange, Southeast Fort Worth, but that they could not determine the number. Saturday at 11.30 a.m., Mrs. May's missing automobile was found parked on the shoulder of the West Freeway near the Clover Lane exit. The car was locked. Homicide <laughs> Lieutenant Oliver Ball found no signs of violence inside the abandoned car. It had been parked across the street from a doctor's office. Mrs. Allen thought her mother might have been seeking a physician's help, maybe for the headache she had. But the doctor said Mrs. May hadn't called or come to his office. Thanks, Emily Flipdilla. Saturday at 1.55 p.m., Officer F.M. Pryor received the call to meet youths at a grocery store at 1700 uh, let's see Delga 1700 Delga on the north side the youths David Rourke 20 and Lee Teal 19 told Pryor they had been riding motorcycle bikes along the Trinity River about 70 feet from the 1,000 block of North Freeway. Let me see. Yeah, see, that's that's where it puts that, right? That's nowhere near the. I mean, the river's way over here. And the levee is going to be like right there. And so I don't know if that's just kind of where they they met up with them or what's going on there. Okay, about 70 feet from the 1,000 block of the North Freeway, they had seen a figure lying on the side of the levee five feet from the top. It was the nude body of a woman. She was dead. On Saturday at 2.05, homicide detective Dave Latham pulled to stop beside the levee. He had received word that the two boys had found a body in the Trinity River. He thought a drifter had accidentally fallen in and drowned, but lying in the tall grass, he saw the woman on her right side, her knees drawn up. It wasn't, it wasn't an accident. It was a murder. Detective W.T. Erie arrived at City Hall and was instructed by Ball to meet Latham at All Saints Hospital Morgue. He found Latham, John May, and Mrs. Allen, the daughter, was shown a silver wedding ring topped by 12 clear stones. Oh, uh, oh, Daddy, she cried. That belongs to Mother. 
May looked at the body in the morgue. That's her, he said. That's Mildred. The daughter dropped the wedding band in her pocket. Saturday at 5, medical investigator R.O. Parkey estimated that Miss May had died about 10 hours earlier. So, let's see. Hmm. So, just late, early, you know, 10 hours earlier. So, that would be kind of like early in the morning, I guess. Dr. Felix Glautz, chief, uh, it's probably some other pronunciation, but I can't. G W O Z D Z, okay? It's probably like Glauzicek or something, you know? It's. He said two bones in her throat had been broken. Hyoid bone. bone. Hyoid bone. Had been broken and that there had been heavy hemorrhaging. Missing were her gold stretch pants, gold shoes, gold purse, and dark brown suede coat with the, with the mink trim that May believed his wife might have been wearing. Police had found her pink slacks in a closet. Latham told Barr, you, you find her clothes and you'll find the murder scene. Now, he said the woman apparently was killed and then taken in a car to the levee, dumped in the tall grass. See, this has some similar feels feel to it, doesn't it? You know? And again, like he, you know, he he's, has had car theft in his life too, right? So he has no problem just taking somebody's car, you know, took her, you know, but then he, you know, probably dumped the car because he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't have anything to do with it. It was a sexual act. So that's why I included this one, because it had a similar feel to it. There, hold on a second. All right. So, uh, found her pink slack. Police had found her pink slacks in a closet. Latham told Ball, you find her clothes and you'll find the murder scene. He said the woman apparently was killed and then taken in her car. So they're thinking she was killed at her actually at her house, right? And then put in the car and driven somewhere. All the skin had been torn off her back and hips. Wait, what is this saying? Oh. Then taken in the car to the levee and dumped in tall grass. All the skin had been torn off her back and hips, Latham said. It looked as though someone had dragged her across the ground by her feet. Wow. So I don't, when they say all, I doubt it was all. It was just like really scraped up. Police today were investigating two greasy fingerprints found above Mrs. May's closet door. Lieutenant Ball, who said there were no suspects, Said no one knows why Mrs. May left her. Left her, uh, excuse me. Oh, that was six. Oh, well, there's, I think there's a little bit more. Yeah, I think there was more up here. Left her house. Shoot. I'd like to see that, but I couldn't tell. Um, huh. Okay, maybe I can find that really fast. I know the date, so... Mildred May. Okay. Lieutenant Ball, who said there were no suspects, said no one knows why Mrs. May left her home that night. Well, she probably didn't. <laughs> he thought her car might have stalled and that she was 
uh, kidnapped as she walked for help. Police don't believe she was abducted from her home. Really? Why not? Her pants were in the closet. There were no signs of violence. Well, yeah. But so what? About, uh, well, that was it. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to read this part. Miss Mildred May, 37, apparently was terrorized for more than five hours. Again, this matches what the other guy did, right? McCurley. Exactly the same shit, remember? Terrorized for more than five hours before she was raped and strangled Saturday morning, police theorized today. Homicide Lieutenant Oliver Ball said police have narrowed the time element in the baffling murder case. He said Mrs. May left an establishment at the Ridgely West Traffic Circle. Oh, so I guess she was out and about at 10.30 p.m. Friday and apparently was driving home. So why'd you guys, why were her pants in the closet though? He said it may have taken about 10 minutes for her to reach the Clover Lane exit on the West Freeway where her car apparently stalled, Ball said. Then Ball theorized she was abducted between 10.40 and 11 p.m. Saturday. There is a pay telephone booth about a block from where her white 1959 Pontiac stalled, Ball said. He said detectives do not know if she used the phone or attempted to use it, or whether she was abducted while working, or excuse me, while walking to the phone. Well, you don't even know if she used it, though. Police have received many calls in the slang, but few have shed any light on the case. This is May's nude body was found about 2 p.m. Saturday on a Trinity River levee about 70 feet from the 1,000 block of North Freeway. Two young motorcyclists spotted the body five feet from the top of the embankment. An autopsy revealed Miss May had been strangled and apparently raped. Dr. Felix Guadz, deputy medical examiner, said a thin mark around the woman's neck indicated she had been strangled with a rope or cord. Um, that woman was really mistreated, Ball said. The time of death had been placed at 4 a.m., more than five hours from the time. Let's see. Police believe Miss May was abducted. Clues are scarce in the case. Clothing Mrs. May apparently was wearing gold stretch pants, gold shoes, and dark brown suede coat with mink trim and a gold purse she was carrying have yet to be found so i guess they don't have that they just i thought they said they found the pants in the closet though police received information yesterday that indicated mrs may was seen about 10 30 p.m friday so that's quite a bit after those last phone calls when she had a headache earlier they thought she had last been heard from when she was talk when she talked to a neighbor on the telephone about 7 30. Uh, let's see, Friday and complained of the headache. Yeah, see? Let's see. Location of the slang scene has not been determined. Ball said if either the scene of death or Mrs. May's clothing could be located, the killing possibly could be solved. Uh, so they, you know, they did a lot more um, investigating and, you know, never, it's never been solved, this case. And that's the spot. See, the so apparently the North Freeway's up there. Here's the bank. Actually, you know, if I was just going to use this now instead of, uh, I would actually say it would be like right over here. You know, I, I think what we're looking at is her body probably, it doesn't look like there's street view here though. Yeah. Yeah, right on this side though. So let me see if this has street view this little side road here no okay I'm gonna take a look at it from right off this then I'm sure there's one right here yeah 
So, I mean, I think this is a levee, especially right over there. And yeah, actually it's probably, there it is, probably a, a little bit further this way. Yeah, there you go. That's the levee. So I think what we're looking at is this is the freeway and she was found pretty much like right over in this area, which has absolutely nothing to do with the address that they gave. Okay, so I think it was right over here. So I'm actually going to move that and just put it like over here somewhere. And that makes more sense. I wonder what those big signs are, though, that they're looking at. I guess it's possible it was on this side, too, right? Yeah, maybe it was just, like, right there. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually gonna put it right there. That's where I think it is. That's a much better match. And there's even a sign there. I think it's right there. Look, look at how much better this works. See, like there's signs there and then there's a freeway right back there. And I just think that that makes more sense. And that even looks like the grass. The same look, it's on this side. So I think that's going to be it. Might be a little bit further over here, you know, but... I'll even move it a little bit just because I can tell it's there's a perspective there. Okay, and let's see what do we got. So they in 1968 still hadn't been found. But see, what's interesting too is the time of year. Okay, so if you remember McFurley, or McCurley, whatever the hell his name is, <laughs> he, uh, it was around Valentine's Day, right? Well, this is right, you know, February 4th, you know, we're getting around that time, okay? So it's February 4th, kind of around that same time frame, you know, you sort of wonder if, if he was just somebody that, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it had something to do with Valentine's Day, I don't know, it's just the same time of year. And then they did have a, a, a guy named Kenneth Granville, 24, already charged with seven murders and one rape. Now is being questioned about other unsolved criminal offenses here with the 1967 murder of Mrs. Milford May at the top of the list. But still a cold case, so that didn't lead to anything. All right, so uh, there we go on that one. So, you know, I actually, it took me most of the day to get all this. I, I've, I've got five different cases here. And we've just done one. The other one was kind of a recap. All right, so I'm going to move. Th this is the one that I think really has me interested here. Okay, this is... June Merlene Ward, and she's 25 years old. And here we go. Uh, the nude, battered body of Cl Cleburne a woman was discovered living or lying near the, it's really hard to read this text, near the curb in the 1000 block of West Fuller early today. So let's see, this is the uh, the Walker case. No, excuse me. Ward, excuse me, this is the Ward one. Uh, I gotta get that open. All right, so her body was found right here. Yeah, so again, like here's all these, the pins and uh, you know, she's found right there. on the side of this road in this in this general area they didn't give a specific (laughs) 
Yeah. Well, it probably is boring. I can kind of tell by the... Uh, I'm just doing it to get it out there, though. But you can always tell by the Super Chats. You know? Because Super Chats is the only way my channel make any money. And in the, in the nights where I can tell people are bored, it just goes... It sounds like this in my head. Oh, I don't have the sound effects up. But it's like... <whistles> wah, wah, that one. Okay? But I'm going to go over this because I feel like it. This is what I want to do. Okay? All right. Yeah, well, that's what that one guy just said. Maybe he's right, you know. That's what that, that's the feeling that I've got. Okay, the woman was identified as Mrs. June Marlene Ward, 25, of 719 Borden Drive. Well, you want, you want to see something crazy here? Look at this. Look at This is where Glenn Samuel McCurley lives right now. This is where, in 1977, she lived. I mean, that's literally, I don't even know, you know, I mean, let's see. <laughs> it's not even a quarter mile away. And then, where he lives now is right there. So it's almost like, I mean, look at this damn thing. That's, I mean, that's crazy, the line, not to say, oh, well, you tried to get in a straight line. But he lives right next to, and he's moved right around this area, right next to where this person lived. Thanks, Kit Kat and Miss Gus. Uh, still feels like one of those shows. All right, so this is one that I really feel like it could be related. Let's just go through the whole thing, though. Authorities were speculating that her death is very similar to at least three other local unsolved murders and over the 10-year period. Mrs. Ward's car was found shortly before the discovery of her body, locked and abandoned on the service road in the 4800 block of South Freeway. Thanks, Val Tiemann and Lee D. Police suspect that Miss Ward may have had trouble with her car and left on the service road sometime after midnight. Oh, well, wow, everybody. Thanks, Val Tiemann. Lee D, One Sly Angel. <laughs> That's right, we're all at cups of coffee, everybody. I'm just Starbucks. Medical investigator R.O. Parkley, so now we got a different medical examiner, said Mrs. Ward apparently had been killed elsewhere and her body dumped. Oh, well, here we go again, right? Killed elsewhere, body dumped. Although that's not absolutely uncommon it's just now we've got the same stuff going on in the same area Parky said the uh, the strap of a woman's brazier was still around the woman's neck he said she had been struck in the head several times with a sharp edged metal object like a hatchet or an axe I mean that's something different right there but he seems a little disorganized too like he's just kind of because remember he had a gun the first time, but he ended up strangling her. And he, may, he probably even tossed the gun in 74, so maybe he started using something else. A lack of blood around the head wounds led Parkley to believe, yeah, she was already dead. I was just going to fill that sentence in. So he strangled her to death, and then to make sure, he hit her in the head with the axe but she was already dead this smacks of the same thing as the mildred may case so they mentioned mildred may that's why i looked up mildred may <laughs> mildred may 10 years ago miss may's nude body was found on a trinity river embankment in 1967 about the same time of year she also had left a broken down car on a fort worth freeway yeah same time of year so guess what everybody this date, I, listen to how crazy this, this is right now. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go gonna show you guys something. Here. So I'm going to go to Carla Jan Walker. Watch this. Listen to how crazy this is. This is insane to me. All right, so this, the first article that came out was February 18th on the case that we just read the search of the arrest warrant on, right? 
Uh, let me get to the first page. Hold on. Um, this one. Here it is right here. All right. So this is the one that we covered yesterday. That's the boyfriend after he got shot at. Look at this. It was, this article is the 18th, and it was the day before. It was bugged by an older youth Friday night. So it was Friday night, and then what day of the week is this paper? Hold on. This is Monday. So it would have been, Sunday would have been the 17th, 16th, Saturday, 15th, Friday. Right? So 15th. 16, 17, 18, yeah. So right around the time, you know, right around the 16th, 17th, or 18th of February, right? That's when she was killed. And it was actually on the Saturday, so that would have been the 16th, February 16th. So now let's go back to this new one. And this is the case of June Merlene Ward, who lived right here, and at the time, McCurley lived right there, but now McCurley lives right there. And if it's so weird, because if you look at this, man, that is, I don't think you could draw a straighter line. I doubt he was, you know, that has anything to do with anything. But look at this. Like, that pin touches all three pins, and he's right, that, that murder was right in the middle. That's pretty weird. I mean, the odds of that are pretty low, that you could put a pin anywhere and you'd never be able to do that. Okay, but check this out. Look at the date on this one. The date of this one is February 18, 1977, just three years later. And it says the nude body uh, of a shorter woman was discovered lit, uh, lying near the curb in the 1000 block of West Fuller early today. So that would be on a Friday. And guess what? That was the same night. It was a Friday around Valentine's Day the last time that there was a killing. I think this is, I mean, I'd be, would not be shocked whatsoever if this case right here is related to that. And I've looked all these up. I couldn't find any of them being resolved. So authorities were speculating that the death is very similar. You know, we already mentioned the one. Um, a lack of blood around the head wounds led Parker to believe that Miss Ward was already dead when she was hit. The This smacks of the same thing that Happened to Miss uh, Mildred May. So again, another February case. I know, that's what I was thinking. A Valentine's Day killer, you know. Hey, thanks Jen H. and Pamela Denise and Emily Flotilla and Dottie O'Caspi Norses. Rock! Okay, investigation continued Saturday into the slang of Mrs. June Merlene Ward 25 of Cleburne, but no arrests were expected immediately. Detective David Weisenhunt said investigators were searching for solid leads in the murder of Mrs. Ward, those strangled, beaten, uh, whose strangled, beaten body was found early Friday in the 1000 block of Fuller. Miss Ward, a licensed vocational nurse, was reportedly on her way to meet a date in Fort Worth when she was slain late Thursday or early Friday. Police have theorized she had car trouble in the area and was searching for help when she met her killer. Yeah, so, I mean, that's exactly the type of guy. I mean, like, for example, he didn't, st I bet he didn't stalk, uh, you know, the young girl and her, and her boyfriend. At the, He just drove by and he's, he was, he's an opportunist. But he's probably traveling around that time. Of, you know, maybe there's something that happened to him around that time of year. I don't know. But you got to admit, that's pretty freaking weird, right? Axe hunted in woman's death. Fort Worth detectives today were seeking a hatchet seen on a Kmart parking lot near the spot where June Marlene Ward's abandoned car was found. Her nude, battered body was found in the 1000 block of West Fuller about 3 a.m. Friday. The woman apparently had been strangled with a brassiere strap and then struck several times in the head with a sharp, heavy metal object. Medical investigator R.O. Park 
Parkey said uh, the head wounds were consistent with a hatchet or an axe. Detectives t today issued a public appeal for information about the hatchet or whereabouts of Mrs. Ward late Thursday and early Friday. Detective Daryl Thompson said a man told police he noticed a hatchet lying near the Kmart store at the intersection of Felix and South Freeway early Friday morning. Police believe Miss, Mrs. Ward's car, a two-door 1973 Chevelle, that'd probably be worth a lot of money today, may have had battery trouble. The car was abandoned and locked in the 4800 block of the South Freeway service road near Felix. It was parked facing south between the Kmart service station and McDonald's. You know, that's got to be, let me see where... Is there a McDonald's around here? Let's see. McDonald's never change, right? I mean, maybe. I will just put McDonald's in Fort Worth. I mean, they never tear down McDonald's, right? Nope, there you go. <laughs> well, that's where I guessed it was going to be. I just, based on what I read in one of the articles, and there's the McDonald's, and this is the, uh, so it's probably right over here. Let's see. Uh, South Freeway Service Road. Near Felix, it was parked facing south between Kmart and McDonald's Restaurant. And I bet you the Kmart's still there, too. So I think it's on this thing right right there. And then, uh, let's see. Kmart. In. Okay, that might be gone. Might have been called something else now, but. Anyways, there's the McDonald's. I think it's right here. Okay, so a little update on that. Pretty close. Yeah, I tried little, you know, tricky things to figure something out. Kind of learned all that stuff over the years. Sometimes I don't, you know, it's hard to do like with the culvert earlier. Uh, let's see. However, there, when detectives searched the parking lot, they could not find the hatchet. So they went there. They couldn't find the hatchet. They did find a pair of women's shoes, but now say the shoes apparently were not Mrs. Ward's. The hatchet was described as a type of carpenter, a carpenter I uses for shingling roofs. It has a wide blade on one end and a hammer head on the other. We feel that the hatchet may be the murder weapon. That just seems so vague, you know, it's like, yeah, somebody saw a hatchet, and, you know. Yeah, so they, 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 there was even an arrest made in the case. So, two Forest Hill youth, 17 arrested in slang. Then the very next day, two youths free in slang. And uh, let's see, test clear suspect in South Side slang. Another person. Police have eliminated a 29 year old Hallman City man as a suspect in the slang of Miss June Merlene Ward of Cleburne. So he was cleared. So they're all over the place. Yeah, about a month later, two youths again arrested in slang. Too freed after question. I mean, doesn't that sound ridiculous? That's exactly the same, exact same thing. Two Utes. <laughs> and then they're freed the next day. And then two more Utes. And then they're freed the next day. Yeah. 
And then this is in August, five months later, they're still looking into it. Let's see if there's anything new here. Uh, police began combing the area for clues and her car was found locked and abandoned along the service road. Somebody probably came by and said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a ride to the, uh, you know, blah, blah. And it's probably that, I, that I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if it's this McCurley guy. I might even call them tomorrow and say, hey, um, you know, I'm sure you guys are aware, but what do you guys think of this case? Now, we're still very active in investigating the case, he said. He added, however, that no major developments have come recently from the investigation. When discovery of Mrs. Ward's body was first made, investigators were haunted by the knowledge that her death was not the first of its kind in Fort Worth. The mother of a small, let's see, of a small daughter disappeared February 7th. Oh, this is a different one. Miss Martin. The mother of a small daughter disappeared February 7th, 1973 after attending a night class at TCJC South Campus. Her body was found seven weeks later in a culvert. Well, there you go. Well, I got another culvert one. I think I need to get this one in here, too. Let me make sure I mean that's only a year prior that's kind of bizarre hold on 1973 uh, 02 07 I think we just added another one here so her name is do you have the full name Eastern Hills Becky Martin oh Becky Martin okay there we go and this one matches more the age too man Becky Martin. Well, hell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, see, I've already kind of think, I think this one might be related to McCurley, okay? So now I'm going to, right now, on the fly, look at this other one, because that one has me more interested, because it's one year prior to the murder of Carla Jan Walker. And it sound and she was found in a culvert. I mean, what? You, come on. Becky Martin. Let's see. Becky Martin. Nineteen seventy-three. Fort Worth. Okay, so that says and it was. Um, oh, and guess what? Guess when Becky Martin was, everybody? February 7th. Right around that same time again. That is crazy. Police were continuing their search late Thursday for a 21-year-old woman whose abandoned car was found Wednesday at Tarrant County Junior College south of campus. Okay, so we're going to do this one on the fly here. This one, got to do it. And this is uh, Becky Martin. Let's see, 2020, oh no, not 2020. 1973, 02, 07. Becky Martin. And we need to go to, uh, and she lives at 116 Southway Drive, Fort Worth, Texas. I think it's Drive. In Everman, Southwest Drive. There it is. That's the one. Yep, that's that's it. Yeah, this is crazy. I knew this was getting crazy when I was looking at it today. 
Because this is what I wanted to look up after that show the other night. It's like, this guy is not a one-off killer, right? Everybody knows that. Just People don't do what he did. He just found a little bit better ways to do it later where he wasn't witnessed by anybody. Yeah. Okay, and... Abandoned car was found Wednesday at Tarrant County Junior... Let's fi figure out what that is. Tarrant County Junior College. Hey, thanks, Lee D. Oh, look at this. Oh, man. he's That's right in the middle of all this shit now. That's where her car was. Well, that's the district office. Is there anything else? I'll just assume. I don't know if that's where it is, but... Tarrant County College. That's just where the district office is. I don't know, but I can't see where another one even exists. So, you know, it's right here in the middle of town. Okay, the woman, Miss Becky Martin of 116 South Way in Everman, was last seen by her husband, David Martin, about 6 p.m. Wednesday when she left home to attend an English, um, let's see, an English, uh, a, a class at the college, an English class at the college. I'm trying to clip this out. Let me get this clipped. Thanks, Lee D, Emily Flotilla, Emily Flotilla, and Carly Levine. Carly Levine. Oh, it's cool in that in the new podcast that we're doing for um, Scene of the Crime. There's a male voice, and I get to do all the male voices. <laughs> I do twelve different times. I'm doing the voice. Male voice by Gray Hughes. All right. Uh, he said he became worried about 10 p.m. when his wife had not returned and drove to the campus where he found her car. Oh, yeah, let me try. Yeah, you're right. Tarrant. County Community College. Oh, there you go. Let's see. Tarrant County College. Okay, let me get the... Tarrant County Junior College South Campus. Oh, that's East. Um, let's see. South Campus. Oh, way over, way over here. Okay, there we go. Thanks for that uh, hint up there. So it's still inside of a range for him. I can see it. Hey, thanks, uh, Stormy Ann. Appreciate it. Hey, maybe it wasn't as boring after all. <laughs> I'm never sure. Yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, God, man. Thanks, Fiber Sleuth. Okay. The woman teacher said she never arrived at class. Mrs. Martin is about 5'1", with brown eyes and dark reddish-brown hair. Worn a, a little over her shoulders. She was said to be wearing bell-bottom pants, red shirts, and blue corduroy jacket. So right now she's just missing in this article right here. That's it. So that would have been on the 9th. And then, see if there's anything 11th. David Martin's husband of 
Let's see. They left out the M. Mrs. Becky Martin, 21, who had been missing since 8 p.m. Wednesday when she left the south campus of Tarrant County Junior College, said late Saturday that he is definite proof that foul play was involved in her disappearance. Hey, thanks, Kevin Brown. Huh. Well, this is getting a little little interesting here. This is a... Uh, we're probably going to get a, get to read this in a second. So let me add this to the folder. 1973-211. I mean, I just think it's weird that they're all in February and they're all... They're so similar. This one's so very similar. 1973-02-11. Okay, now let's go up here and read this one. Becky was wearing corduroy jacket, he said. Man, this person can't type, whoever typed this in. So, let's see. When she left the South Campus of Tarrant County Junior College, said late Saturday that he has definite proof that foul play was involved in her disappearance. Thanks, Boggle Queen. Becky was wearing a corduroy jacket, uh, he said. I've been working with the... Uh, with the, uh, let's see, Everman Police Department and a private investigator, and we found corduroy impressions in the dirt film of the driver's side of the door, of my, uh, by the door, let's see, in the dirt film on the driver's side by the door, like there had been a struggle, like she was on the ground next to, huh, where the car was, yeah, weird. What we believe is that someone may have been waiting in the in the car for her to come back. I just think there was somebody waiting for her to come, you know, somebody to come back out to a car, perhaps. I don't know if they're waiting in, in her car. Maybe there were two people involved. One of them might have crouched in the back seat and grabbed her. And as she got away from him, he then the other person may have grabbed her when she got away. The impressions on the driver's side are what make me think this, huh? I don't know. I don't know what they're saying. If let's see, film of the driver's side of the door. So, like on the side of the door, there was corduroy impressions. Well, maybe she was about to get into the car, and her pants were against the door. Who knows? Uh, Mrs. Martin, who lived in. At 116 Southway in Everman with her husband and daughter, Carrie Two, was last seen leaving the TCJC Student Union building not long after she handed in an English test. She was wearing bell-bottom pants, a red shirt, and a blue corduroy jacket. Martin said he also has found dainty, finer prints like those of a woman around the driver's side of the car and some of them appear to have been made by hand scratching for hand handholds i think she was on her way back to her car about to get into her car and then somebody abducted her we've come or she could have even been uh, seated already and pulled out much like mccurley did to the girlfriend of the in the original story where she was in the passenger seat though and just opened the door and pulled her out. Okay? So there's a, every, there's a lot of things that seem so similar at this point. Martin said he also has found dainty finer prints like those of a woman found the driver's side of the car and some of them appear to have been made by hand scratching for handholds. We've come up with a lot of different leads said Martin, now a security guard. We're using people to get involved. We're urging people to get involved to call the police with anything they think might help. Oh, shit. Hold on. That wasn't a... Got to get that back open again. All right, so this is Becky Martin. There it is. Right, let's see what's going on on the 21st now. So they're still looking for her on the uh, 21st. Wild. And let's see on the 28th. 
Officer seeking motive. The skeletal remains of a woman found Monday. So this is March 28th. So this is a month and a half. Wow. Okay. And that's that's going to be her where she was found right there. Let me uh Got to save some of these things. Oh, I put those all in the wrong damn thing. Shoot. Uh, let's see. 1973. 03. image. Okay, I gotta I gotta move these other ones over. Okay, got everything in the right folder now. I had them in the wrong one. All right, so that's that spot. So we're probably gonna be able to get this mapped out here. The skeletal remains of a woman found Monday in a culvert under a secluded road near white settlement were positively identified tuesday as those of miss becky martin now it says the skeletal remains were found monday this is wednesday so if we look at the on the 27th now so if we go to march 27th 27th 1973 and is there anything in here? This might be when a body was found right here. Yeah, so here it goes. A search for information about a decomposed body found three miles west of here yesterday afternoon was to begin today. The body, thought to be that of a middle-aged or older woman, was found in a culvert on a secluded stretch of White Settlement Road. Okay, so let's go to that. Let's go there. So, White... Settlement Road. Yeah, it's not really that far out of town. All right, so let me, I'm just going to put a pin on White Settlement Road. I don't have a clue where it is at this point. All right, there we go. Okay, the, the body might be that of Miss Becky Martin, 21, of Everman, missing since February 7th after she failed to return from night class. County medical examiner, that same guy, Dr. Felix Gwautz, <laughs> said, however, an initial examination most likely eliminates Mrs. Martin. Wow, so he immediately said it wasn't her. These teeth are close together, he said. Miss Martin was... Supposed to have had a gap in her front teeth. James Edward Anguish, 26, of Hearst, who also, uh, who along with his wife and mother-in-law, found the body, he said, and stopped. Yeah, let's see. It's on page two. That should be this next one here. Genetic science. Topic of sessions. Hey, that was 1973. They, they were onto something. Well, I mean, anyways, I'm just going to go to a different article. Of 
Okay, investigators at first thought the body might be that of Miss Becky Martin, 21. However, after the initial examination, the body later, uh, the guy didn't, he didn't think it was because of the teeth. But we think this is, is possibly a female. It's not a teenager on account of the condition of her teeth. These teeth are close together. The body was found about 5.30 p.m. by James Edward Anguish, 26, of 560 Souter Drive in Hearst, his wife Maxine, 26, and his mother-in-law, <coughs> Ruby Luttrell. Oh, I need some water now. <coughs> oh, man. Yeah. Hey, Houston, uh, you're on the wrong channel here, okay? Yeah. All right, thanks. Have a good one. We, we weren't talking about that case, but good luck. Uh, let's see, the body was found. Okay, Anguish said he stopped his car near the culvert. Both women were walking along the roadside. Well, you know what? They're, it should be kind of easy to find. Because it's on this road. It stops right there. White Settlement Road. Where, where is there a little a creek of some sort? I mean, that picture... Seemed like it was, I don't even know where that is now. Where was that? Yeah, right here. So there's a creek, apparently, near there. That didn't look like where he was. It looked like they were almost on like a bridge. But I mean, this is so long ago, right? 73. Let's see what it looks like in 95. Yeah, I mean, look at 95, right? Oh, well, here you go. This is a better picture for finding a creek. So 95. And then maybe, I think that's where I just was, right? Yeah, I think I was just right there. But yeah, even in 95, look at that, there's nobody out here. It's almost completely empty. All right, how about right there then? There's another spot. And that's definitely another culvert right there. I mean, but don't you find it interesting, though, that, uh, God, I wonder if that's it. Man, that really looks like that could be it, maybe. I, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say. Like, if you were down below, would it look like that? I don't see this part here, though. See, I don't see that side. But maybe I'll put one here just in case, you know, just so I don't lose it. And that's not really that secluded. Okay, here's, looks like that's water right there running through. Here, here's a good place right here. I think that's a good one there. I'm just going to put a pin there, but I'm going to, I actually feel pretty good about that spot, just looking at it. 
And I, I had almost bet money that that's it. I, had, I almost bet money. See, that's what that's what this might look like if you were down to the side and filming it, right? And that's a bigger creek, and that's exactly what I would think right there. I would bet money that that's it. And it's kind of a culvert, it's just really large. And that, see, that's where a big stream goes through. You know, there's other possible spots, but, you know, back then that was probably a pretty secluded area. I mean, look, there's hardly any, even in 95, there isn't really a ton of housing there. There's some back here. That's where I'm going to put that. Yep. Yeah. That looks very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go with that. So interestingly, her body's put into a, a culvert-like area, just like this one. A year later, another person that was abducted. And I, I, I don't know. I'm gonna. <laughs> I hope they're still looking in and trying to match other DNA samples, because I think that this McCurley guy. Uh, might have some, as they say, splaining to do. The body was found about 5.30. So they, they said it wasn't her because of the teeth. But then the next day, it turns out it was her. Long wait. Fruitless women wait fruitless for women's family. The car was where Becky Martin might logically have left it, but much about the vehicle seemed amiss. The inside of the car, the seat and dashboard were splattered with muddy footprints. The outside of the car also was mud covered. Its tires caked with mud. When Miss Martin had left home, wow, they didn't say anything about there was mud all over it before the car had been cleaned. Miss Martin's school books had been flung into the back seat of the car. Her class notes, cards were strewn in a puddle 100 feet from the car. Yeah. See, I think she was at her car. You know how you just toss your books in the back and then you were about to put something else in there and then boom! You get, you get abducted right from your car. I don't think the car was... I mean, it's possible that they actually took her in her car and then put it back there. I, I don't know, though. That'd be kind of a strange thing to risk like that. Well, somebody's looking for her. Oh, then you drive back to the same spot. She had been re reluctant to go to class. Okay, here, here's this article right here. Co-ed's body identified by dentist. Fort Worth and Tarrant County officers searched the area Monday, but found no clues. A half dozen sheriff deputies returned to search again. We went back and searched the area Tuesday morning, and we didn't come up with a single thing. Uh, so this is uh, started on page one. Let's see what it gave for the location. The skeletal remains of a woman found Monday in a culvert under a secluded road near White Settlement were positively identified Tuesday. Well, maybe they need to revisit that medical examiner. He sounds like one of the ones that work in Georgia. This is Martin's dentist. Dr. H.L. Stewart identified bridge work, also x-rays, corresponded to x-rays uh, he had made earlier of Miss Martin. Police had no leads and cause of death remained a mystery. Only a single shoe was found nearby. Officers speculated the shoe may have been 
washed into the culvert by recent rains. Miss Martin had been the object of police search since the fail, uh, she failed to return home from a night English class on the south campus of Ter uh, Tarrant County Junior College. Her husband. Let me let me let me zoom in. So this is the same image, I guess they have in that article. <clears throat> Martin knew the body was his wife's, he said. Hmm. I kind of want to read you this whole thing. <laughs> Let's see. David Martin knew the minute he saw the body on the TV news, it was his wife, Becky. It was covered up except for the hair. The hair was shown, he said. She had long, wavy hair. It came all the way down to her waist, beautiful hair. I've got a real good picture of her. He found the picture in his billfold. It was fixed like this the night she disappeared. All the curls, he said. In the picture, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Martin smiled. Southern bell ring, let, uh, let's, what is that? Ringlets around her face. Even when Martin was told it wasn't Becky, he knew it was. I knew when I saw it was her. He might even have had a premonition. The night before, Saturday night, he had nightmares all night long, said his mother, Mrs. Margie Martin. I was up all night with Carrie. She had them too all night. Carrie is Martin's two-year-old daughter. Maybe somebody was trying to tell me something. Martin was home from work sick Tuesday when police called to tell him the body was that of his wife. Some of Mrs. Martin's girlfriend's former neighbors had come over to be with the family. Yeah, let's see. Mrs. Martin had completed two hours of study on South Campus. She was studying to be a special education teacher. Dr. Rushing said he believes the college had taken more than adequate precautions to protect persons in, her, in its campuses. The college has what he believes is a very fine security force of adequate size and a well-lighted campus. A terrible event of this kind could have occurred on any parking lot. Mrs. Martin was a 1969 graduate of Trimble Technical High School. She was married a year after graduation. Other survivors include her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Donald O. Whitaker, and, uh, hmm. Man. That's some crazy crap right there. So anyways, I think that this one, and the one that we talked about earlier, the 1977 June Merlene Ward, could be also related to McCurley. Because remember, we were just looking at it. This is where Ward lived. And then McCurley lived right here at the time. And now he lives right here. Uh, absolutely perfectly straight line. Doesn't mean a damn thing. But it was just kind of odd. And then uh, her body. I mean she, her, she was also abducted. Yeah, it would be amazing if they're not related. And then the night that 1967 one, you know, that's could be related. It has a lot of similarities too. But uh, the 73 and 77 one would be interesting to me if I was police, because you know that he lived here in 1972, and then he he's lived here since uh, let's see, since 19. Oh, so he lived here since 72. Um, and then I think it was the other one was from 78 on, right? Yeah. So it could be that he lives in this one now. I can't remember if I flipped this around or not. but um, Wow. Insane. Insane. Let's see what happened over the years really quick, though, with this one. So 1973... Let's see if we have anything in April 1973. Garments found do not belong to her. OK. 
Okay. May 1973. And then they start really petering off a lot. And then I'll try 1974. Police also plan to question Neeland about the death of Becky Martin. Murder of Becky Martin Fort Worth. The second victim of the February slayings. Hey, somebody else came up with that. That's crazy, right? Came several years after Mid uh, Mildred's May's 1967 murder. Disappeared on February night in 1973. Her remains were found over a month later on the outskirts. The second victim of the February... Let's see what they say here. Oh, that's actually part of a, uh, a podcast called Gone Cold, I guess. Huh. Well, it's cool to be able to go on the... Find the same sort of path that others did. Yeah, I was thinking more like Valentine's Day, but it is kind of like just February, I guess. All right. Let me try just 19, 1975 to 1980. I don't, I don't think they've been solved. Yeah, see, now it's just ads and shit. See, it's weird how they just, boom, they're gone, you know. So I'll try one from... 1981 all the way to 2010. Okay, was that just probably not even... Yeah, now it's just a different Becky Martin at this point. Sarah Connor. Okay. Well, those uh, that one hasn't been solved either. I think they have to look at this guy. Don't you think? I mean, how could he not be responsible for Becky Martin and uh, Lisa and June Merlene Ward, who live right next to him, right during that same time? He, the one known killing that we know for sure was 1974. Then there's a 1973 killing before her, uh, the same time of year, but in 73, just one year prior. And she's also found in a culvert, abducted while she was getting into her car. And then a year later, another girl is abducted while she's in the passenger seat of her boyfriend's car. And then her body is put into a dumpster. I mean, a, a culvert, excuse me. Is who's still alive? Yeah, we, we covered it last night, Fiber Sleuth. Did you miss the show last night? Yeah, they did. They just arrested him using DNA technology. And I read you guys uh, the um, arrest warrant that Kubi got from the Sheriff's Department. Now, these other ones I was looking at are, you know, they're not in the February again, but they were just in the same area, but they were, like, all three were 84. See, here's the thing. In 84, there was this massive, I think there definitely is another, either another serial killer or it was just him again and not caring about the months, okay? Because it, it gets really nutty. See, look at these are all from 1984 right here. Judy Heron, uh, Angela Lee Ewart. You know, just tons and tons of people were killed. I actually have this one document that, uh, well, this is a cool website. It actually, you can just research each one and just kind of look up to see what the MO is. So you could literally go over here up here in the URL, see up here at the top, 
see a lot of times if you look at the top here and then you just go heck I want to look at uh, 70 like I, a, a good one would probably be 1970 to 1979 and then boom now you've got all of these other killings right here and that's June Ward right Didn't we just do that one? Yeah, June Merlene Ward. See, that's her. On February 18th, 1977, again in February, a person walking in the thousand block of West Fuller found the body of June Ward lying next to the curb. It was later determined that she had been strangled. You know, but again, her car's involved. You know, it, it, there's, it's just something that's so similar about all of them. And then you got another one, June 4th, 1977. The body of was found lying in a field in Cobb Park. Her car was found at another location in the park. It was later determined that she had been strangled. See, this is another person, but it's a different time of the month, it looks like. Yeah. So that's a cool website. I might have to keep digging through this one. Yeah, I'm not a big coincidence person at all. I've never, every time I see stuff like that, I don't go, oh yeah, yeah, it's just a coincidence. All right, so this one is Marilyn Hartman. We can just see if these sound similar or not. Fort Worth police are investigating two slayings, including the death Friday night of 19-year-old woman who was bound, gagged, and then strangled after apparently surprising a burglar in her home. That's probably a different one. Homicide detective K.R. Watts said the woman, Marilyn Hartman of 7,000 Sunday Place, was found by relatives on the floor of her bedroom. She apparently was killed earlier Friday evening, police said. So another Friday one. Uh, let's see, so we got Hartman. Yeah, so she doesn't live far away from all the rest of them, right here in this house. And that's just them assuming that it was a burglar. The woman's car was missing. See, again, car gone. A jewelry box from the bedroom dresser. The woman was also reportedly wearing several rings earlier in the day when police found the body. She was wearing only a gold bracelet. And they have no leads. On Sunday, police were investigating a third slaying in which a man was found bound and strangled in his south side home. Crazy. Uh, police said Castillo was found about 7 a.m. Sunday by his brother. Marilyn Hartman of 7,000 Sunday was found bound, gagged, and strangled in her home. So maybe that's a different person. And that's all there really was on that one. Hardly any information at all. Here's her uh, picture right there. On October 19, 1984, some of Marilyn Hartman's friends went to her house to visit her. They found Marilyn Hartman's deceased in the house. She had been strangled. She was a teacher and at uh, Stripling Middle School. She actually seemed like she was pretty accomplished, like she was kicking ass. A memorial service for Marilyn Roger Hartman, 29, a Fort Worth School teacher will be sev at 7 tonight at Angelic Weber Funeral Chapel. Uh, Miss Hartman died Friday night at her Fort Worth home. She was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and had lived in Fort Worth for three years. She was an English and social studies teacher at Stripling Middle School. She received an undergraduate degree from Arkansas Central State and graduate degree from Arkansas State University. Uh, University. Yeah, so I mean, she, 
Mrs. Hartman was a member of the Gospel Kingdom Church of God in, in Christ and the Fort Worth chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Service Sorority. Survivors include her husband, Stuart. I mean, yeah. She was doing really well. She just... Some whack job just came in there. and I mean, who knows if it's him now, right? See, look at this, though. See, here's what I was just talking about. So she's one of these listed here. But these are all 1984. Listen to that. Look at that. Davis, 23, a secretary, disappeared September 29th from her garage apartment behind 3404 Park Ridge Road. Um, there was blood on the door of her vehicle where it was found. Uh, and it was found October 6th at the Westcliff Manor Apartments. Her scattered remains were found January 23rd, 1985 in a field in far south Fort Worth. Ewart 21, a Fort Worth receptionist, disappeared December 10th, 1984. Her abandoned car, yet again, was found in the Interstate 20 near Interstate 35W. Her body never been found. Gregory 29, a Fort Worth waitress, disappeared May 28th, 1985. Her uh, wrecked and abandoned car was discovered the next day in the 5500 block of Bridge Street near her Woodhaven area home. Gregory's body with a single gunshot wound to the face was found floating May 30th in the Trinity River near Rockwood Municipal Golf Course. A fisherman pulled her body from the river. Griffin 20, a Fort Worth receptionist, was found shot to death near railroad tracks south of Benbrook on January 1985. Michael Wayne Gooden of Fort Worth was convicted of her murder in, in October 1985. He is serving a 43-year prison sentence. Well, I wonder if that's these two could be related right here, right? Because that was another gunshot wound. A Grover 21, a bartender and her boyfriend, David Larson, 26, were found dead December 23, 1984. Grover was strangled and her body was found under a bridge in North Fort Worth. Worth uh, Larson's body was found in South Fort Worth. Oh, that one has, you know, at least it, under a bridge, that's similar. But Hayden, 18, a restaurant hostess, was stabbed 57 times September 5th, 1984, in her Fort Worth home. Wow. Probably some guy. 57 times. Heller, 23, a receptionist, disappeared October 22nd, 1984, after helping a stranded motorist near Eulen Mall. Heller was reported missing by her boyfriend, Nathan Gaspard, after her fire-damaged car was found the next day a hunt at Hunter's Ridge Apartment, 4850 River Ranch Road, Heller's decomposed body was discovered January 5, 1985 in a creek behind a Texas Christian University dormitory. An autopsy determined the Fort Worth woman had been strangled. See, this one could be related right here. You know, because he's only like 40-something at the time. This one here is, has a possibility. Because it has a similar, you know, opportunist type deal where she's just, you know, helping a motorist. You know, maybe that was the, the trick he'd use. I don't know. Jackson, 32, a teacher was found in her bathtub November 26, 1984. She apparently had been strangled with two men's ties in her Fort Worth home. Her 1975 Camaro was stolen. See? You know, that's what this guy did, too. Remember, he stole cars. I don't know, man. They could be looking at some guy here that is a big-time serial killer. Because people don't do what this McCurley guy did, and they're not a serial killer. Kasha, 15, a student from Denton, disappeared December 30th, 1984 from the Wedgwood Terrace Apartments after spending the evening with friends in Fort Worth. She was found stabbed to death January 1st, 1985 near Mountain Creek Lake in southwest Dallas County. 
Taylor, 25, a Fort Worth homemaker, disappeared March 25th, 1985. Her body was found four days later in a grove of trees near Loop A20 and Randolph Mill Road. Isn't that just ridiculous? All these people that just... Yeah, he could be. I don't know if all of them, but I think uh, there could be a couple on here for sure. This girl right here, Heller. Cindy Heller. I mean, that sounds really uh, similar. You know, it is a few years later, but it's not really that later. I mean, 74, and then maybe the 77 one is related. And I think he was like 33-ish in... 74 so then he would only be you know 45 now this is uh, one it's a little bit interesting here the uh, Judy Heron an extensive manhunt in northwest Tarrant County on Tuesday failed to turn up a suspect in the brutal strangulation of Colleyville woman and the attempted killing of her five-year-old son earlier in the day at their exclusive Terra Planta plantation home. Killed was Judy Heron, 34. Her son, Daniel, was in good condition at the hospital Tuesday night. A second child, David, was found unharmed crawling around the house and the Heron's other child, Amanda, was in an elementary school during the attack. Colleyville police, along with other authorities, used helicopters and bloodhounds to search for a suspect, described as a heavyset white man wearing army fatigues, boots, and a ski mask. After the slaying, the killer fled in a car owned by Heron, but he abandoned it short, a short distance from the house and may have fled on foot, police said. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting place where she parked the car. So her body was found in, in the house. So it's this nice house right here. I don't know if, I don't think there's street view here. Oh, I guess there is. Yeah, I mean, it's really nice home. I'm assuming that was there back then, but that's... That's the house. And then the vehicle, her vehicle, was found. I mean, it totally makes sense. The person pulls out, goes like this or this way, whatever, and then drove, and then the car was found right here on the side of the road. Now, did they have a car already waiting there? It sort, sort of sounds a little bit like Photos Dulos at this point. You know, like, did he have a car waiting there and got in that, or did he just want to drive out unseen and then walk from there so that none of the local people would have seen him. Yeah. So he slipped through the dragnet they had. That's the vehicle right there, the Jeep. And that's actually a picture of it on the side of the road. And that's them taking her body out of the house. Here, let me, let's check something really fast. Now that we got, I think that is the same house. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you can see the bricks on the side of the house and even some of this stuff right there. See? Yep, they were just taking her out that front door right there. Or they probably parked right there, I would think. Thanks, Emily Flotilla! We had one of those um, droughts <laughs> that, that Kit Kat talks about. 
anyways, I think those two are pretty good possibilities of being connected. Don't you think? Or three, really. They're, well, the 67 one has a chance. But I think those two were very similar. One living right next door and then the other in a culvert. Yeah, so this one was never solved either. All of these are like that. So I'm going to move on to the, another one. It was the Katherine Jackson. I had a lot of other newspaper clippings, but uh, the last one she was just found in her home. Let me, let me hold on, let me check something out. Yeah. So in her case, Tarrant Medical Met, uh, Medical Investigator James Seabury said the victim's hands and feet were tied together and the cord looped around her neck. He said she was face down inside the bathtub. Seabury said an exact cause of death would not be known until after an autopsy. Kratz said the body bore several superficial burns apparently caused by from the hot water. Man, so somebody sounds like they wanted to torture her. I don't know. That doesn't really sound like the same guy. I mean, none of the other stuff sounds the same. Huh. Sort of. I wonder if, they, if there was like a hit. Like the, the husband wanted to... Ah, shit. I don't know. That just seems so strange. You go in there, tie her up, and then burn her in the bathtub water? That's got a lot of heat in that one. Yeah, we know, Mark. We covered it all. Thanks. Yeah, let's see. Well, maybe just poured as hot water as possible in the tub and put her in it. I don't know. There's even a 2012 article here. And they're, they're just mentioning that maybe this guy, a guy named Foot F-O-O-T-E, maybe he was related, but it's still unsolved at this point. So here's the last one now. We're on Catherine E. Jackson. Thanks, Dadio Caspian Horses Rock. An eighth grade teacher was found slain this morning in the bathtub of her West Fort Worth apartment. See, another one in a bathtub. See, that's a little interesting now, because the last one was just found in the bathtub. Police said clothing had been piled atop the bound, another bound individual. So is this one here related to the last one, except this doesn't have the same M.O. as the other killer, but how do you have two stories in the same year with bound women in a bathtub in a, in a similar location? Yeah. yeah. Police said clothing had been piled atop the bound nude body of English teacher Catherine Jackson, and the hot water had been turned on. When the body was found at 9.15, AM the residents in Ridgemar Park Apartments at 201 Aiden Road Yeah, not really that far away from the other spot there. So she was found in one of these apartments here. Um, let's see. James Pollard, principal of Irma Marsh Middle School in River Oaks, said he went to Jackson's apartment after she failed to show up to work. So let's see, Marsh Middle School. Okay. 
So that's where she taught, right there. Look at all this, all these pins associated in that area just during that time frame. Kind of tells the story. There's, there would be a lot more too if I put all those other people in there. She didn't show up for work and her kids came to my office to tell me she wasn't there. She's very punctual. You knew something was wrong when she didn't show up or uh, up her call. Pollard said clouds of steam rolled out of the apartment door when he opened it. Well, that's interesting. So that means it was her hot water again? Jackson, 32, had taught at Irma Marsh for three years, school officials said. Homicide detective Paul Kratz said she had been out of town for Thanksgiving weekend and neighbors heard her return about 7 p.m. Yes. Wow. I, I thought I was reading the other the other article. Wow. <laughs> um, Kratz said the body bore several superficial burns. Wait, is this the one we already read? Is this in the other one? Hold on a second. Huh. I wonder if that's the same article that was just in the... God, now I gotta go back to the other case now. I'm confused. Killed was Judy Heron, 34. Her son, Colleyville Police, along with the authorities, used helicopters and bloodhounds to search for a suspect described as heavy set. After the slang, the killer fled. Um, Knocked, kicked in the door, tied them up, and strangled both of them. Wow, the slain woman was found in a master bedroom closet. So this is different. The previous case, I think I, mu I must have conflated them together, but Judy Heron was found in a closet, but she was strangled. Yeah. Police said she was killed by a masked attacker who broke in about 9.30 a.m. All we know is the subject knocked kicked in the door, tied them up, and strangled both of them. The, the kid lived, though. He apparently strangled the mother, and somehow the boy, Daniel, escaped and went for help. That was the previous case. Hey, thanks, Jessica Shuba. All right, so this is uh, Jackson. We've had a couple teachers, though, in this tonight. She was found strangled in her home in the exclusive Terra subdivision. Oh, I think maybe they're okay. I think they're saying they're they're relating it though. Earlier this fall, two other Fort Worth women were found strangled, but police said they had not no direct evidence indicating a connection. On October 19th, the body of 29-year-old Marilyn Hartman was found in her home at the seventh. Thousand Sunday Place in Southwest Fort Worth. On November 13th, Judy Heron, 34, of Colleyville, was found strangled in her home in the exclusive Terra subdivision. The three killings are similar in that they all three involved women who lived in affluent areas under development, providing an easy cover for an assailant who might have escaped undetected as a construction worker. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. There's probably a couple different uh, serial killers around there. But definitely, in this case, I think that this one here, two of these might be related to McCurley, the guy we were talking about yesterday. Anyways, I think that's about it for me, you guys. I thought I'd, you know look into what we were talking about and I'm, I might actually call on both of those see what they say
and say, have you guys checked out these two cases? Because they sound eerily similar. Yep, Zozo. Hey, Zozo has a golf tournament, by the way. It's amazing. Thanks, Pamela Denise. What do you mean, what about the missing... What are you talking about? I wasn't talking about a missing trio. <laughs> Zozo wants to sign everybody's balls. No double entendre there. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that one, Boggle Queen. If I had brought it up, I would have been talking about it. I'm, I just covered like five different cases, maybe six. Well, I don't really care if there's a reward. I don't do shit for reward. Yeah, it's all the same year. There's tons of them. I don't think, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really interested in that one right now, though. I, I just covered the ones that I thought sounded exactly the same. Wow, you're out of balls, huh? No, yeah, he could be related to millions of them. <laughs> well, not millions, because it take too long. Thank you. Yeah, well, why don't you send me a link on the ones you're talking about? Because I, I wasn't, I didn't look them up or anything. So, I think it came across one time when I was looking at it that there was a, a whole family that was killed or something. But yeah, I want, I was looking for a single, individual females where they were strangled, and there was a vehicle involved, and two of them seem. Very, I mean, they're, they're both in February as well. One of them lived right where McCurley lived all these years. You know, almost like he, he kind of wants to stay where he, you know, it's a little bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, just send me a link or something. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you guys coming on tonight. Thank you to the uh, Lee D, Zozo, Kit Kat, Lori Staggs, Emily Flotilla, Emily Flotilla again, Fiber Sleuth, Dottie Caspi Norse's Rock, Kit Kat, Miss Skiss, Val Tiemann, Lee D, One Sly Angel, Dottie O'Caspi Norse's Rock, Emily Flotilla, Pamela Denise, Jen H, Lee D, Emily Flotilla, Carly Levine, and uh, Stormy Ann, thank you very much, Fiber Sleuth, Kevin Brown, Boggle Queen, Emily Flotilla, Dottie O'Caspi Norse's Rock, Jessica Schubach, Pamela Denise, thank you. Oh, and then also on uh, Sharon on uh, PayPal. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, anyways, I am going to... took me most of the day to get all that stuff together. Especially trying to find ones that seem like he might actually be involved. I would say out of the two, that this one right here... The one from um, 1977, June Merlene Ward. Man. Yeah, I mean, that one's interesting because of the, where he, uh, he lives. But you know what? This, well, both of them, to me, have the same validity. The Becky Martin, 1973, where her body's found. She's abducted at a college right at her car and then her body's also found in a culvert just like the um, Carla's body was so come on those very well could be related very well 
Thanks, Zozo, for the 87 cents. <laughs> What's that face you got at the end there? What the hell is that? Nah, he's going to have to come forward. And I think they're going to find out that he definitely didn't do it once. Nobody out there, out there at all, goes up to a car, uh, pulls a girl out of the car with a gun. In the middle, there's people all over the place. Takes her out of the car, takes him in his car, keeps her for a day or so, and then dumps her body in a culvert, and then that's the only time they ever did something. Not a chance. Not a chance in hell. Yeah, what's that? That does kind of look like him, Zozo. Does kind of look like him. Yeah, and just think how easy it would be for that guy uh, at other times when there was nobody around. Like a girl coming back to her car after class late at night. You know? Or a, a woman out on a highway whose car may have broken down. Uh, well, I mean, those, I think they exist because I've seen videos on those deep fakes. Yeah, pretty good. It's kind of creepy, really. You can take uh, a video and make their lips move and they say stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't want you to put the link there. I just wanted you to send it somewhere else in like chat and stuff like that. Ah, Jesus. Hey, thanks, Jay Case. Yeah, pretty good. I was just ending my show, though. <laughs> I've been on here since 7. Just got home. How's H-U-Z-E-E and the Freak Fam doing? I don't know, Mike. I don't know, Mike. Yeah, that was the same year. That's, you know, it's kind of interesting there, Boggle Queen. Pretty interesting. They were probably, I think they were in that other file that I was looking at. I wonder if they think that maybe Carla... I mean, it's the same mall, I, I guess. That's what you said, anyway. Yeah, 4200 South Freeway. Yeah. Let's see if that comes to the same one. Yeah, I don't know if that's the same exact one, but... I know you guys aren't looking what I'm looking at, but... Yeah, it's not, it's not near the bowling... It's not the same bowling alley. It's not even close. I, I'm looking at it right now. It's, so it's not this... When you say it was the same store, it's not. The same place, I mean. See, this is where 4200 South Freeway is, right at this, whatever that is. And then the, uh, the bowling alley is way over here. That's where Carla was abducted from. It's just, called, it's just something else now. Yeah, it's not the same one. Yeah. I just showed you. But anyway, yeah, it is 1974. They all went missing. I've actually heard of those before. I've seen all those pictures before. I think people have covered those on lots of podcasts and so forth. But anyways, all right, everybody. Thank you guys all for showing up. Which podcast are you talking about, Sarita? But thanks, J. Case. 
<laughs> yeah. You have to go check it out. I think there's the person that we were talking about last night. The killer. McClure, uh, McClurley. Mc, God, now I can't say his name again. He uh, probably killed a couple other people. It seems like it anyways. I, I can't say for sure, but it sure seems like it. And so, you know, maybe they're going to check on that. They did say that they're going to start looking into a lot of other cold cases. So hopefully they can match up some more to the Barbarian. Hey, no problem, Boggle Queen. Oh, I don't remember. Like something cold or something. I think if you looked up uh, February murders or something like that, you might find it. Yeah, how's the uh, hospital work there, Jay? How's COVID doing? Is it starting to drop? I've only been out of my house probably like when I only when I drove up to Seattle to get surgery and then maybe six other times this entire time. <laughs> It's pretty weird. Maybe a couple more than that, but. What are you talking about, Cristola? I have no idea what you're talking about. We just did a whole show on Fort Worth murders. Yeah. I think everybody wearing these masks are working. It's starting to like kind of make it drop a little bit. Plus, there's herd immunity starting to build up in some communities. You know, like if you have a community with a lot of younger kids that may have gotten it but never, and then maybe they have young parents, you could have whole communities that ha hardly have anything. Any cases, or and they're not really going to the hospital or anything like that. Like, let's say you're. You know, 32 years old and you have a eight-year-old kid. Well, I mean, you're both of you are pretty safe at that point. So the fires made people sick from uh, COVID? Or just sick from other things? The fire. Yeah, we're not we we weren't talking about that one. Just just go back and watch it later, Crystal. Oh yeah, crazy. Okay, well I gotta get I gotta I'm gonna get going, so I'm gonna dress this wound and then I'm gonna sit around and uh, do absolutely nothing, okay? But I appreciate all of you. Thanks, Jay Case, right there at the end there for the uh, donation. Made the night almost a normal night. <laughs> but uh, that was pretty interesting. You know, and then we found another case and bam, jumped on that one. The 73 one was cool because that one was so similar. So similar. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. I'm going to just kick it right over to the wrap. Make sure that you're wearing your masks, maintaining your social distancing, and um, you know, wash your hands when you can. Whenever, whenever you're out, for sure. If you're at home for a while it's, and you live by yourself, you don't need to wash your hands every three seconds. Okay, but out in the uh, out in the public, I would never go in any building without a mask on your face. <laughs> well, thanks, Jay Case. Now we're almost right there. <laughs> I think they should find people. I think not wearing a mask when you go to a grocery store is idiotic. Okay, I don't give a shit if you live in Texas. Okay. It's just not, it's not good.
Wow, only two trolls tonight? Amazing. Hey, look at that. 400... I didn't even know... I thought there was only 150 people watching. But hopefully you guys... Um, you know, hit that like button really quick. So if you're out there, hit the like button. And in the chat, put a 1 if you think it's possible that the... Or not just possible, that it... It seems like there's a good chance that the 73 case of Becky Martin and the 77 case of June Merlene Ward may have both been killed by McClurley, McClurry. Yeah, put a one. Let me hear what you. Let me see what the poll is on that. And that and that would be the same individual who killed um, Carla. Carla Walker. All right. Well, pretty crazy. Yeah, McClurley. That's what I thought it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, 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 you were here last night, Jay, right? Where you saw that, you know, the, the case of Carla Walker, who was killed, and her body was found in the culvert. Well, we got the, we read the warrant earlier in the show, and that was Kubi found that, and then we um, found exactly where the culvert was. I had it in a little different spot. I had it up here, uh, but it turns out that the her body was found. Okay, I think that's a different one. Hold on. Where was that culvert? Oh well. I have to find the uh, where that went. I've lost the pin. I'm not to go find that one now. I think it was south down here. Yeah, right. I think it is this one. Yeah, that's that lake. So let me see where I have this. I have to put it in the right folder. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this is where... Carla Walker was found after she was abducted from her boyfriend's car while the boyfriend was in the car she was found in this culvert right here the cement culvert right there okay so that was 1974 abducted from the car and she died of strangulation then in 1973 it just came out while we were researching tonight's show that there was another individual, a college student. She was getting into her car at college at, at night and was abducted at her vehicle. And then her body was found, and she was strangled to death, and her body was found in another culvert right over here. Right underneath this culvert right here. Okay? So those two MOs are almost incredibly similar. Absolutely similar, okay? And then in 1977, there was another case. She was strangled. And her, her vehicle was found, and her body was found on the side of a road, not in a culvert. But check this out. So this is the June Merlene Ward. This is where she lived, right here. Well, check it out. This is where McClurley, the killer that was just arrested on DNA, he lived right here in 1974, and then he lives here right now. He's lived here since 78, and look at that. I mean, this house where that girl lived was literally, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this happened. This, this is so random here, but watch this. If you take a, a pin from where he lived before and then put a pin right on his house where he lives now, 
her house is right on that line, which probably means absolutely nothing, but the odds of that are like one in a million. I mean, to, to you could have lived anywhere else and it wouldn't do that. But boom, she lived right there. You draw the line on pins and it hits right on the house of a victim of somebody. But it seems like, wow, that really could be one of the people he killed. So there you go. That was the quick recap for those of you who got here a little bit late, unfortunately. You know, make sure you hit that uh, like button. All right. I don't have the button to hit. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Yeah, same MO, but look at, look at where that one girl lived, too, the 77 one. And then he just moved a little bit. And he wasn't scared to live, move where he, where his victims may have lived. You know, he probably thought that made him seem less guilty. No, I haven't. I was gonna maybe call them tomorrow. Actually, I'm going to. Okay, so I don't want other people. Oh, I'm gonna call too. I'm gonna call. You know, just let me go do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it just seems like same mo right where he lived. I mean, Fort Worth is pretty big. You know, like there's houses and homes all over the place. And he lived right there. He lived in the same area all those years, from 74 to 78. And he's lived in this house here since 78. He still lives there, or not anymore because he was arrested. He lived in this one in 74. So that means he lived here till just after this murder and then moved into this one. Come on. Man, God, that's crazy. All right, everybody, that is it for the show tonight. Thank you all for showing up. Wear your mask, maintain social distancing, wash your hands, and don't be one of the idiots out there that's protesting and breaking stuff up in a case that they just came out with the investigative information. And it, it was really, it's not a case where there was murder involved with Brianna Taylor, okay? Murder, there was no murder there, okay? It just does, it just didn't happen. They they were shot at first by the boyfriend. They even said that they were going there. I mean, they knocked on the door, identified who they were. It wasn't a no knock situation. They opened the door. They kicked in the door. I mean, because after that they kicked it in, because nobody answered. And then when they kicked it in, the boyfriend of Brianna shot one of the officers in the leg. Then they returned fire. And Brianna was standing in the hall next to him, and she got hit six times. One bullet was fatal. Okay? Now, it's not her fault. What happened to her absolutely sucks. And actually, what even what happened to her boyfriend? The thing is, though, it wasn't some weird intentional... There's no Race has absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. They just went in there, and that is what happened. It, it just... A gunshots came out. Now, they did get one guy on recklessly shooting somebody. All right. You know, like shooting. He didn't even, you know, he just started firing into the, into the area, but he isn't the one who ended up killing anybody. Thirteen to two hundred? What does that mean? Oh, cool. BNB? You're a too light. Awesome. Excellent. So if you're not a channel member, everybody, make sure you become a channel member. You can get those cool emojis that everybody else has. Check them out. They're B and B. You can click on the uh, emo emoji button down there, and you got you can pick from pick from like 18 or or so. Yes. Yeah, just answer the door next time, or maybe not just fire immediately as soon as somebody breaks in the door. You know, you might want to say, just like you want police to do, you want police to say, hey, you know, so it's a little bit hypocritical, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Yeah.
And then when they say, there was no justice, there was nothing. Really? You, every, um, you got $12 million settlement from the taxpayers. That means all the p citizens in the area paid for the accident that happened. Okay? So there was some civil actions that took place. No, well, they had plain clothes on with a vest that said police on it. Who cares, Rebecca? Jesus. You know, um, they broke in the door. They were officers. They were shot at. They returned fire. God. My God. She's always looking for an angle to make it something. You know, it's like. Yeah, they had the vest on that said police on it, okay? Yes, stop complaining about the incident now. Unfortunately, two officers were shot tonight in the complaining about it. Oh, it was murder, everybody. It was murder. Really? What about all the murders that happen in, that literally are murders that happen in Chicago every single night? Uh, well, that one doesn't fit this, the narrative, so don't talk about that one. All right, everybody. That's it. I'm going to get the hell out of here before... Uh, I stay on too long. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. All right, everybody, have a good one. Thank you very much. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, beep, beep, beep. I have not seen one person. Hey, hey, this is that cool rap. This is that cool rap. Right, B and B. B and B, B and B, B and B. Zozo and Magazarita and Rebecca, Pamela, Pamela Neese, J Case is on a case. We get a case. Food reflector, interceptor. And I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector with all respect, y'all. Just remember, I've a temple fucking check, ya. I yeah. have no agenda. I'm the pretender. True and that, J.K. True pretender. that. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on, on a mission, mission to dude. reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. All right. Hey, that was really fun. Hey, that was really great. That was one of the greatest shows in the history of mankind. Don't you think so, John Boy? Oh, my God. Did you drink coffee tonight? Have another cup. God, I was just excited about the show. Can I be excited about the show, John Boy? <laughs> God. Wow, were you actually going to cry right there? All I said was have another cup of coffee. My God. Well, I mean, you were saying have another cup of coffee because you said I was talking too quickly. Well, yes, you sounded a lot like the auctioneer that when that when Gray plays when he tries to get people to hit the like button. Oh, that was like a saying. I'm twenty-five, thirty-five, forty-five, fifty-five, sixty-five, seventy-five. Hey, you were here twenty-five, thirty-five. Wow, that was that wasn't too bad at all. You should actually do that for a living. Okay, I'll do that for a living. Well, thanks for the coffee. 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 Thanks for the did we get out of this one safe? We sure didn't. <laughs> Man, those two, boy. I tell you what. <whistles> wow. All right, everybody. Thank you all for showing up. You guys can hang out in the chat for a while. I'll leave it going. <laughs> That's right. That's right, Zozo and Jay Case. Who, who do you guys like the most? Is it John Boy or is it... Uh, Mary Lou. <laughs> Mary Lou's like like Chloe, really, just really bothersome. Just blue is more like John Boy, I think. All right, anyways, see you guys later. Be safe out there. <laughs>